Welcome to Russian History with Dr. Bravkin. Today, I continue our discussion of uh, Putin in power. Several videos devoted to President Putin and his policies since he came to power in 2000. Now, in the last video, we discussed the, how Putin came to power, the role that played by Primakov and uh, the preceding political situation, and I'm not going to repeat this here. But what is important to say here is that when Putin becomes president in March 2000, he had a number of urgent political problems. And that is what we're going to do. We're going to discuss one problem after another and how he dealt with it that would constitute a kind of a political portrait of his actions. Now, there are several very important problems. Uh, number one, I would say, is the oligarch problem. And then there was the uh, war in Chechnya, the, the secessionist movement of uh, in the south of Russia. And then there was the governor problem, and then there was a corruption problem, and then there's a poverty problem, and all kinds of other problems. But today, I will focus on the oligarch problem. The reason this is number one is because one of the oligarchs actually put him in power. Uh, in the preceding video, I discussed that Yeltsin nominated him as a successor, but in real life, Yeltsin was really manipulated by the oligarchs, and, and one of them was uh, Boris Berezovsky, who was really the kind of a kingmaker behind the scenes. He was the one that was orchestrating the attack on the Skurat of the, um, the, 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 the uh, investigation of corruption by the courts, and, uh, and so on and so forth. So, so Berezovsky was number one. Uh, but generally speaking, who are the oligarchs? Uh, and, and what power did they have in, the, in 1999? Now, the oligarchs uh, are, could be compared for the American audience to the robber barons at the end of the 19th century. These were millionaires, and they uh, pretty much controlled the American economy. People like Carnegie, Car uh, like uh, Rockefeller, like Morgan, and others. Uh, in fact, there's a famous uh, incident when... Uh, Morgan said, who is this guy to mess around with my business? And he meant the president of the United States, Teddy Roosevelt. So there was a time in America when very rich uh, robber barons did have a, a, quite a control over economy and significant influence on politics. Now, in Russia, uh, the, the problem was that American uh, robber barons they made money in America, they built factories in America, they invested in America, and they kept money in America. Now, that is not the case with the oligarchs. The problem is they didn't build anything. They seized the property that had already been built in Soviet times. They privatized that pol that these assets into their own hands, and they moved money out of Russia. Uh, there's in these years, the statistics available, tens of billions of dollars were shipped shifted overseas uh, and put in foreign banks. And as I mentioned in the last video, one of these was the scandal of the Bank of New York, uh, where many of these oligarchs kept their money. And then there was a scandal and including the investigation, the hearings I took part in, Yeltsin's daughter was one of the persons who figured in this case. Now, they moved money out of Russia. That was unacceptable because the country is poor. They, they, uh, there was this amazing poverty, unemployment, co corruption, and, and they just, Russia couldn't afford to lose billions and billions of dollars shifted overseas by those who control its economy. Now, politically, these people were pro-Western. They loved the West. They loved talking about democracy. They loved uh, moving their money in the West. They owned, many of them owned apartments in London and country houses in the south of France. And Berezovsky himself owned both an apartment in London and a house in the south of France and another estate in Surrey in England. So, so that, that is the kind of political profile of these people. Uh, how did they get their money? And this, again, as a separate topic. I wrote an article about it, making money, moving money, parking money overseas in a journal called Democratizatia, Democratization, a journal of post-Soviet uh, democratization. If you want, you could find it. But the point is, it was very simple. It was that the government issued stocks. Uh, 
uh, in this kind of a auctions of privatization of state property. And uh, the price of these stocks is ridiculously low, and it was offered through the inside channels to so-called favored banks. And then these favored banks would get these, uh, these assets for a ridiculously low price. Again, uh, going back to last video, I quote Mr. Sokolov, who came to us uh, as a visit in American University and gave a speech which is published in New York Times. If you look for 1999 Sokolov, you will find it. Now, this is an official record, uh, and so I can cite it. He said uh, that for, for some of the major Russian factories producing aluminum and, and many other uh, precious metals, the price at the auction was 600 million, uh, and it is actual value was six billion. In other words, this is the pattern. The oligarchs got the assets of the germs of Russian industry, oil, gas, uh, aluminum, metals, and so forth, for 10 times cheaper than what it was worth. And then they became, became the oligarchs. And they just basically robbed their own enterprises and moved money overseas. So these were people like Potanin, the Nickel King, Deribaska, the Aluminum King, Berezovsky, the Aeroflot King, which is the uh, airlines company, and the uh, Berezovsky owned uh, also the, the uh, Channel One, a major, the first channel on Russian TV. Gusinsky uh, owned several newspapers. Hodorkovsky uh, owned the Yukos, which is a big oil company and so on and so on it goes that these group of people were collectively known as the oligarchs. Now, uh, it is reputed that uh, Berezovsky, when uh, Putin became president, told him something like this. And again, I don't know if this is the truth, but it sounds like it could very well be that he said things like this. He basically said to me, you know, Vladimir, you can stay here for four years You'll do what we tell you, and after that, you'll just retire with a lot of money. Uh, and that's the deal. And now Berezovsky was a behind the scenes kingmaker. He was the one who uh, promoted the previous prime minister, Stipashin. He was the one who fired Primakov. He was really the kingmaker behind Yeltsin, who was mostly sick or drunk or both. Now, uh, Berezovsky specifically bought himself a Duma place, which is a member of parliament seat, in a small Karachayo Cherkessia, which is a small province in the North Caucasus. Now, his assets were many times over than the annual budget of this little province. And so, therefore, he could easily nominate himself and probably, you know, convince the, those people that he would be a good Duma member. Why did he need that? Because that gave him personal inviolability. He couldn't be tried in any court as a member of parliament, as a member of Duma. So this is why it was convenient for Berezovsky to protect himself like this and have this uh, in inviolability. Uh, so Berezovsky was a spokesman for the family, which means for Yeltsin. Uh, and uh, one thing that they really needed at that time is a guarantee, as I discussed last the video, a guarantee that there'll be no rollback of privatization, that the assets that they got would be safe. And that didn't look like this if Primakov came to power in a new elections together with uh, Lushkov and uh, with the support of the Communist Party. That was on the agenda to roll back the privatization. Now, uh, Putin gave them this guarantee. Now, why was that? I don't know. But my guess is that Putin was among those who felt that a rollback of privatization could escalate to chaos again. And the last thing Russia needed is more chaos. Uh, and chaos usually follows when you have, you know, revision of privatization. Uh, there, there could again be, you know, all kinds of fights and, and uh, murders and, and all kinds of things. So he made a decision uh, for, for whatever his motivation was, no more rollback of privatization gave these guarantees to uh, Yeltsin and to Berezovsky and uh, others and uh, as we see now he kept his word in most of the cases. Now uh, 
Putin's uh, agenda was to reverse the equation. It, to reverse meaning it is not that the oligarchs who would dictate policy to the president, but it would be the president who would dictate policy to the oligarchs. And that's pretty much what he did. He turned the chairs on Berezovsky very early on uh, in the summer of 2000. So in July, uh, Berezovsky was forced to surrender his uh, immunity in, as a deputy in the Duma. And uh, later in the year, he was forced to surrender 50% of his stake in the um, uh, first TV channel. And then later there was a, a criminal case opened about the manipulation of the IRF law, and he was forced to abandon too. Uh, just one case, uh, how did Ira Flood case develop? It's very important to see how did these oligarchs steal money from Russia. Ira Flood is an international uh, airline company, and there were a lot of receipts coming to Ira Flood offices from all the foreign places it flew into, Paris, London, whatever. Now, these money were in foreign currency, and so they opened up a company that would hold these assets in foreign currency, and that is the trick. Uh, it was supposed to be sh shipped back to Russia as the headquarters or, of Ira Flot, but in fact it was kept overseas and then channeled off to private accounts. In other words, Berezovsky was stealing from his own company, and that was the problem. And this was going on with many other assets of many other oligarchs. They were dismantling their assets, uh, they were selling whatever they could sell and moving the money overseas. Uh, and that was the problem. So, Berezovsky is out. Now, how did um, Putin deal with the next one? And his name is Gusinski. He is the o owner of the Media Most, which is a, a holding company of several newspapers and the TV channel. And again, it's the same thing, same model as everywhere else. He bought it 10 times cheaper than what it was worth. He bought it for $5,000 and it was worth 10 million. Now, again, once this all surfaced up, he quit, and in the year 2000, he went to Italy. Uh, now, how did Putin know all this? This is, a, again, a guess that I have. I suppose that his contacts with the FSB, which is the Federal Security Service, helped him very much. He was the head of FSB before being prime minister. So I think that his knowledge of all these dirty deals uh, through the, uh, through the police uh, connection was very helpful in bringing up all these cases. Then the next very, very famous case is that of Hodorkovsky, who was the owner of Yukos, a major oil company. Uh, and the, the, the famous moment is the meeting that Putin had in July, uh, is, sorry, in February 2003 with the leaders of uh, Russian industry, which means with oligarchs. And at that meeting, Putin said something very important that, uh, you know, explains his approach to this whole issue of oligarchs. So listen, this is important. Number one, there will be no rollback of privatization. You can all be rest assured that assets and private property will be preserved. Number two, there will be a reliable, permanent and low tax of 13%. There will be defense of private property in the courts. Uh, but you must bring your money back to Russia. And there's a pardon for those who will. There will be no persecution of anything like this if it's uh, within reasonable time brought back to Russia. And then he used another term, and that's the key, which is called Ravna Udalonist, which means equal uh, detachment from politics. Uh, that is the key condition. You do not engage in politics. You can keep the money, so keep the money, but keep out of politics. That's the formula that Putin offered to the oligarchs. And most of them actually accepted it, judging by the fact, but many of them to the present day, such as Potanin, the king of nickel, are still there. Deribaska, the king of aluminum, is still there. Abramovich uh, is the you know, right hand of, of Yeltsin, is a person who is a partner with Berezovsky in dividing up Siberian oil company. He's still there. By the way, he won the case in the British court against Berezovsky, and Berezovsky's misery and poverty in London is not because of Putin, but because essentially 
uh, Abramovich took over whatever Berezovsky owed, won in the court, made him poor, uh, and essentially survived successfully to the present day. He keeps a low profile, no involvement of politics, you know, keep the money, keep out of politics. He followed it and he survived. Those that didn't, didn't. And so the one that didn't is uh, Khodorkovsky. He started financing uh, political opposition. He started giving money to the Communist Party. And even more so, there were some rumors that he was going actually to run for presidency himself. Now, that was an absolute no-no to Putin and actually to many others who believed that as a matter of principle, Russia should not be turned into a country where one oligarch would change another uh, in power, where the most rich people would be the ones who would buy themselves through the channels of mass media and uh, uh, influence through other means on the governors that they would become presidents. So, so, so Putin does the same thing as he did with other cases. He opens up a criminal investigation and there's all kinds of dirt that was found, including murders, tax evasion, all kinds of things. He was found guilty by the courts. He was imprisoned. Then a couple of years later, he was uh, pardoned and released and then went on to Switzerland, where he promised not to engage in anti-Russian activity, but he still does, and does give occasionally interviews what a horrible person Putin is. Now, I finish with this with a conclusion. Uh, Putin successfully turned the tables on the oligarchs, destroying them one by one, those that did not want to play by the rules he set. And this was one of his greatest accomplishments. He freed Russia from the thieves and the oligarchs who robbed it by the billions of dollars, and he moved them out of politics and allowed them to keep their money. Uh, thank you. We'll proceed next time. Don't forget to subscribe. Bye.